Good evening, guys. Can you hear me clearly? Welcome to、uh, our、uh, PLG Mesa Master Exam Revision Session. This is Tony、um, presenting. It's it's the light is a little bit dark, right?、Uh, let me see if I can change the lighting condition here. Oh, the answer is no. So just、um, bear with me, okay? Ah,、uh, okay. Now, why is it so dark? I hate it. But wow, just live with it. All right. <clears throat> uh, thanks for coming to our uh Mesa Master Exam Revision Session for Cubas Five Thousand One. So I've collected a lot of uh ideas from all of you. Um. You know, I have a click the.、Uh, we have a form. If you fill in the form, we will know what you want to say in, in the、uh, in the revision session. And I found that、uh, I summarized all of those、um, ideas, and I found that you basically have.、Um, um, I mean, for each topic,、uh, you 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 have at least one problem. So、uh, we have no other choice but try to find、uh, try to cover all the topics that you've learned, and particularly in some.、Um, Key、um, confusions, for example, covariance versus、uh, correlation coefficients,、uh, as well as portfolio diversification, and、uh, to the weak four central limit theorem, we'll be focusing on those topics、uh, as well. So now,、um, the first thing first, if you are new to this university or even new to Australia studies. One thing you have to keep in mind is that in order to achieve a high, a high, not distinction, a high marks in in this unit or in any unit here,、um, the key thing that you have to achieve is to to form a what we call a in depth understanding. Okay. So this is a little bit different from、uh, if you are coming from other universities before, or even、uh, any other overseas university before. So the key thing that that、um, the markers want to say in your exams is not to calculate、uh, the number correctly or to to recite the definition correctly. We won't test on that. But、um, the key thing is to show your understanding、uh, in the exam process. So some of you also ask,、uh, what are the proper process、uh, to answer distribution questions, and we will also cover that as well later. All right, yeah, I know it's a bit dark, but、um, I don't know why it's so dark. Probably、uh, the length is dirty. Let me try. Is it brighter? No. Okay.、Uh, why is that? Okay. Uh, forget it.、Uh, I don't know why it's so dark. Uh, it, it's not that dark before, but who knows? Um, there's no light. All right. Okay. So in order to form an in-depth understanding, I'd like to start with the very basic concepts. But but before that, I'd like to give you an overview of our live streaming, and it's probably not only for today, but um. Ah、uh, yes, the live will be recorded, ah,、uh, but that's because um of what I'm talking about. Ah、uh, yeah, today's live, ah、uh, not today's live, but the whole live series will basically cover three things. The first thing is about descriptive ah、uh, statistics, or descriptive measures that you learned in week one, ah、uh, oh yeah, basically in week one, and secondly, we will cover probability theories. As well as the probability distributions, so probability theories and probability distributions, and the third thing we want we're gonna cover is the um, oh it's my shadow it is it my shadow yes I I think so yeah I'm blocking the light、But、anyway uh probability and distribution and the last thing is central limit theorem, uh which is sampling distribution, so central limit theorem. So it's、uh, still uh, it's basically up to the time. Um, if uh we don't have enough time, I will cover each topic every day 
So maybe tomorrow there's another live streaming, and the day after tomorrow there's another one. So uh, we will uh, make everything as detailed as I can, so that uh, you can get a um, better idea of uh, what you learned for the first half of the semester. So the first first thing first. Uh, and it's also what we're going to cover today, descriptive measures and um, some details of uh, those descriptive measures. Okay, so when we talk about descriptive measures, I think it's very important that you, you get to know uh, the big picture of a Cubus 5001, or big picture of statistics, because uh, when you have this understanding of the big picture, you can solve a lot of problems that you might not be familiar with before. So for example, big picture of uh, statistics. Now, the first pair of K terminologies in statistics is about population and sample. And uh, this is quite straightforward for all of us, I believe. Population and sample. So in reality, we are interested in the features of the populations, but we can never get to know the populations. So we take a sample and try to figure out, I'll uh, try to use sample features to infer the population features. So another pair of K definition is called parameter and statistics. Parameter and statistics. So parameter, statistics, what is a parameter? If you went to your tutorial or, or lectures, you might have noticed that parameter is a descriptive measure, descriptive measure of population, right? Or population or whatever, population. And for sample statistics, they are defined as a descriptive measure of samples or a sample. Okay, here are the key words that you, you have to know uh, about week one content, okay? Because sometimes you may have seen some multiple choice questions asking you which of the following uh, about parameter is correct, or what is called uh, that a descriptive measure calculated from a sample to infer populations, and then the answer should be statistics, okay? So, uh, well, this is not, uh, well, this is the plural, well, I, I would say statistic, okay? This is the single term of statistic, okay? Now, one more thing you have to notice is the difference in the notations between parameters and statistics. So what I mean by that is that you have to know that parameters are mainly noted using Greek letters, okay? Greek letters. For example, what does population mean? Anyone remember what is population mean? It's mu, right? And population varies, sigma square. Population standard deviation, sigma, right? So you can see all those descriptive measures for populations are denoted in Greek letters. So when you are calculating sample mean or what whatsoever, never write mu or sigma square or, or sigma, right? Okay, so that's all about parameters. And for sample statistics, so this is the first thing you need to know about parameters. And uh, for statistics, they are usually denoted in capital letters, okay? Capital letters for capital letters so for example sample main is x bar right and uh, sample variance is s square and uh, sample standard deviation is s so on and so on so 
that's the first thing you need to know. The difference in the notations uh, in Greek letters and capital letters, they stand for population parameters as well as sample statistics. All right? So that's the first thing. Uh, you need to know about the differences between parameters and statistics. Secondly, this involves your understanding of population parameters and sample statistics. So do you think the population parameter is a random variable or a fixed number? Okay, so you have also to think about whether it is random or it's a fixed number for parameters. Okay, also think about whether statistics are random variables or fixed numbers. So this is very important uh, for your understanding. Okay, fixed. Okay, someone say population parameters are fixed. Exactly. So for population parameters, they are fixed. That's because... Um, for any population parameter, if we have, let's, here is the example area, okay? For the example area, if, let's suppose we have a population that uh, has five elements, one, two, three, four, and five, okay? So this is, let's suppose this is the whole population, okay? And uh, when we think about the population parameter, for example, population mean, so the mu must equal to one, two, three, four, five, it's three, right? And we can say, once the population is fixed, and the population parameters are fixed, no matter if it is population mean, a population variance or standard deviation, they are all fixed. So for the population parameters, they are fixed. But for sample statistics, they are random because, for example, let's take uh, let's now take different samples. Okay, if I take any random sample uh, of sample size two, and uh, I got one and four as a sample, in here, the x bar is calculated to be what a one four five or two point five, right? And if I get two and uh, five right so this is going to be x bar is going to be 3.5 so you can see every time we take a different sample uh, the sample statistics are observed to be different right and in week four you'll actually learn uh, the sampling distribution of any sample statistics uh, basically sample means so so far you need to know that for this capital letters x bar or s square or s they are actually stands for random variables but you may have noticed i use small x over here why is that all right so um for small x's they actually uh, stands for um, the observed value of the statistics or the random variables okay so the big x stands for the random variable themselves, okay? So the big, uh, the capital letters usually stands for the random variables. But for the small, value, uh, small letters or lowercase letters, they are the observed values, observe the values of random variables. So in here, you have to understand for example, sample mean itself, x bar, is a random variables. But once we t take any particular sample, they are, they are going to be fixed, okay? So, of random variables. All right. So, that's basically all about the definition of parameter and statistics. And uh, for, the, for the exam markers, I believe it's very easy for them to tell if you really understand the difference between population parameters and sample statistics by not misusing the Greek letters, the capital letters, as well as uh, the lowercase letters, okay? So, the key takeaway here, okay? Key takeaway here.
is to know the difference between Greek letters, capital letters versus lowercase letters. Okay, you had to know the difference between all of them. All right. So key takeaway of this page. If you've already taken them away, I'll change to a new um page. But uh, uh well, but, but, but before we change to a new page, uh, one last thing I want to mention because the, when we talk about big picture of statistics, uh, it's mainly about population and sample stuff because we're gonna use the sample statistics to infer the value of the parameters. So uh, we can summarize this process in two different stages. So stage one is called descriptive statistic, right? Descriptive statistics. So for descriptive statistic, they are basically learn, uh, you, you're gonna basically learn how to describe the features of either populations or samples. So basically in descriptive statistic, we learn all different kinds of parameters or statistics, or even we learn a lot of uh, diagrams, right? To describe the data. So all of those belongs to descriptive statistics. And I believe this is covered in weeks uh, one, two, three. Well, two and three are, are, are actually probability theory, but they still can be considered as descriptive statistics, okay? And uh, the second part, which is something that you're gonna learn after the mid semester exam. Um, this branch is called inferential statistics. Inferential statistics. So for inferential statistics, it's mainly about using sample statistics to infer the values of the population parameters. So uh, you probably have learned that uh, the sample, um, sample mean is an estimator of population mean. Sample variance is the estimator of population variance, and so on and so on. So inferential statistics is mainly about using statistics to infer the value of population parameters, right? parameters, okay? So using sample statistics to infer parameters. And this will be mainly covered from week five to week um, even 13 or week 12. So the whole second half of the semester, you'll be learning inferential statistics. And some of you might ask, oh, wait a minute, where is week four? Well, week four, it's very special topic. And it is, I believe it's the most important topic of the whole semester, week four, because it requires us to understand central limit theorem. And I believe it serves as the link, a, a link between discrete statistic and inferential statistic, because it provides us with us the sampling distribution of uh, sample statistics so that it it founds the basis of the whole inferential statistics. So if you have no idea of what week four is talking about, I believe you will struggle a lot when you learn inferential statistics for the next um, week five to week 13. But you know, uh, in mid semester exam, we'll only be covering week one to four. So, uh, so far you don't have to worry about the inferential statistics, but um, they are still very important, okay? Now, let's come back and see the big picture of statistics before we move on to the detailed descriptive measures, okay? So big picture, uh, in statistics, uh, we, uh, we are interested in the values of parameters, and they are defined as descriptive measures of populations. However, in reality, we can never calculate this parameter precisely. So instead, we have to take samples, and trying to find out the value of statistics and try to use the statistics to infer the values of the parameters. So that is inferential statistics. And before that, we had to use uh, the, a certain uh, discrete measures to describe the world or describe the features of both populations and samples first. So uh, yeah, 
And the key takeaway, as I said, is the difference between Greek letters, capital letters, and lowercase letters. So you, hopefully everybody ha is happy with uh, the page over here, okay? So if you're happy, we will move on to the summary of uh, all um, uh, discrete measures. So hopefully uh, you can just um, think about uh, and summarize that with me because it's not a very hard thing, okay? Not a very hard stuff. And uh, in this area, many students are asking what is screwness and what is kurtosis and what does the Kurt function in Excel mean? And uh, some of you also uh, are questioned why we bother calculating CV, which is the co coefficient of variation. And also why uh, we consider correlation coefficient instead of uh, the covariance itself. So after this, uh, probably hopefully 40 minutes, uh, next, uh, well, not that long, 30 minutes, uh, you are able to identify um, those differences in the um in the in those concepts okay all right so now in terms of discrete measures uh, i'm going to talk about okay what what's going to happen next uh, okay what's gonna happen next so in the next uh, half an hour we're gonna discuss the following several aspects i don't know how many but let's see so we do have discrete measures for central tendency. So this is the first thing. Now, let's uh, summarize uh, all the descriptive measures for central tendency together. And uh, for each of the measurements, let's uh, think about both the population parameter version, parameter version, as well as uh, being a statistic version, okay? All right, cool. Now let's um, talk about description for central tendency. Um, so what is the first thing you can think about? The easiest one, exactly, mean. So this is the most commonly used descriptive measure for, um, for central tendency, right? So, um, okay, so the parameter version is denoted as mu, right? And the calculation formula is is uh, simply i from the first observation to the nth observation. You add up uh, all the observed value together or any value in your population and then divided by, oh, I don't have space to write that, but divided by big N, which is the population size, right? And for sample uh, statistics, um, it's X bar. Here you have to be, uh, know it's it's big X bar because it's a, a um, random variable. Okay, so big X bar is one over n multiplied by i from one to n and uh, x i. X i stands for each unit you you take out from uh, a population. It's also a random variable. Okay, because when you take any sample point from population, it's a random variable because before you sample it, you will never know what you're going to get uh, from a particular sampling. All right. So statistic version and parameter version of main. And what else do we have for central tendency? Well, we still have two other ways, right? We have uh, median and uh, mode. For median mode, there are no particular uh, calculation formulas actually, right? So for medians, uh, it's uh, the, uh, the, the number in the middle, right? So the number in the middle. Well, some of you say screwness and variance. Well, we are talking about descriptive of central tendency. So in your exam, if you ask, for example, in a multiple choice question, which of the following is a measurement of central tendency? And you got mean, median, mode, and uh, variance. Then what are you going to choose? And then you're, you're going to choose mean, median, mode for central tendency because variance is the measurement of uh, how dispersed uh, or how fluctuate um, the data is, okay? 
Uh, so variance is not a measure of um, central tendency. Yes. So Jirassel W is is talking about uh, three M's, right? Three M's are for measurements of central tendency. So median is the middle number, and for mode, it, it's uh, actually um, the number that occurs the most, okay? Or the data point that occurs the most. So it's the number that occurs the most. Okay, so it's the number that occurs the most frequently. All right, then you need to think about when shall we use mean, median, and mode. So for mean, uh, what types of data can we use mean to describe its central tendency? It has to be numerical data, right? or data. Well, uh, I, I, I've been in Australia for four years, so you should understand. I like pronouncing data instead of data, but yeah, but in my heart, it's still data, okay? You have 40 gigabytes of data monthly and, and uh, with a home phone rental or whatever. But anyway, numerical data, the data, all right? So mean, uh, mean uh, use can only apply to numerical data uh, because for categorical, it doesn't make sense, right? But for median, uh, it can be numerical data, but also it probably can be used in uh, categorical data, okay? Uh, but for mode, it can only use for non-numerical data, so categorical, either ordinal or just categorical themselves, okay? So uh, you have to know what kind of data can be applied in each of the categories of uh, the descriptive uh, descriptions for uh, central tendency, okay? So if you don't have any questions, uh, we will move on to the next uh, part, which is the descriptive of central tendency. Uh, I mean, I mean var variation. So no questions, all right? Now, uh, let's move on to... Uh, the second um, topic. The second thing is the descriptive measures. Oh, I forgot measures in the last uh, slide. But anyway, descriptive measures for what? Variations. In here, uh, we do have some uh, understanding that you need to know regarding descri those descriptive measures, all okay? right? So, now, in terms of uh, the descriptive measures for variation, again, uh, we do have parameter versions versus the sample statistic versions, okay? Uh, so I call it para version or stacked version. So first of all, um, the most commonly used one is variance, right? Okay, so we have variance as the most uh, commonly used uh, ones, variants. And for the population parameters, it's calculated by, it's denoted in sigma square, right? Sigma square instead of uh, uh, S, okay? So sigma square and one over N, so it takes the average of the sum I from one to N, and then uh, take the difference between each observation minus mu, mu is this population mean, and then square it, okay? So this is how we calculate uh, the population variance. But for sample, oh, it's shaking, sorry about that. Uh, probably we're talking about variation, so the screen still want to variate, or fluctuate, right? Well, I'm just kidding, because it's today's April Fool's, Fool's Day. Have you got food today? Uh, if not, then, uh, what a shame, right? <laughs> okay, uh, so for statistic version, it's S square equal one over here, you have to pay attention, it's N minus one instead of N because N minus one stands for the degree freedom of uh, all those uh, sum of squares. So, um, so far you probably don't need to understand why it divided by N minus one, but later on when we talk about uh, when we when we learn in week seven, uh, analysis of variances, you're gonna probably have a new understanding of uh, variance, um, hopefully. Okay, so I from one to n. Well, here should be big n, right? This is small n for sample size, 
and for each observed value minus x bar, x bar is sample mean, right, and squared. So this is variance. And uh, for, uh, for, for, for standard deviation, standard deviation, uh, again, it's just the square root of variances, right? So standard deviation, I'll just ignore the square root. It's square root of uh, sigma square, right? Uh, S square is the square, oh, sorry, S is the square root of S square. So uh, they're basically the same thing. But by standardizing that uh, variance, uh, we actually canceled out um, the unit uh, effect, okay? Well, um, here, I would like to share with you why we um why we use variance and standard deviation in measuring the volatility of a set of data. So if uh, I define x axis to be the number of observation, okay? I mean the, the 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 number or the order of the observation. So one is for the first one, second one, third one in our data set, and uh, the horizontal axis. Uh, sorry, the vertical axis stands for um, the um, the values uh, of the the value of the observations. So within any set of data, we probably have this. Uh, we can see this kind of uh, uh, fluctuations in the data, right? So to best um, describe the va variation of this set of data, we will first figure out the mean or the average of this set of data. It's probably here, right? So for example, x bar is here. And then we use each data. For example, this is the first data, x1, and uh, minus x bar, uh, and try to find out whether this difference is large or small. I mean, the total difference is large or small. But at the same time, if we do have a positive and both positive and negative differences, so that if you take a square on each of those difference, so this is x1 minus x1, right? So if you take a square of each of the differences, you can make everything positive. So we add them all together, uh, and then divide by the total number of observation or its degree of freedom so that we can get a sort of average variation on each data point, okay? So it basically describes the average squared deviation on each data point. So if the original data is in dollars, the, the variance must be in dollar square, right? So that's why we take a standard deviation, or we take a square root of the variances. So yeah, and then we got uh, uh, dollar for standard deviation, okay? Oh, blurry. Someone says, uh, oh, it's probably because uh, the, the, uh, the internet becomes slower. Sorry about that. I believe once you, uh, if you watch um, the, um, uh, the recordings, then you can see the cleared version of uh, all of those, okay? And sorry about that. Uh, I'm in ABS, so blame the ABS internet, please, okay? Oh, just kidding. All right, and for other measurements of variation, well, you may still have range, right? So range is it's easy. And no matter it is parameter or statistics, it's the maximum value minus the minimum value from a set of data. So it's range, right? And uh, also someone mentioned interquartile range, exactly, interquartile range. So you got the first quartile, uh, actually the third quartile, right? The third quartile minus the first quartile. So uh, for those detailed things, um, you can refer to your textbook or your slides because uh, they are just, um, they are very straightforward stuff uh, and you will definitely be given any formulas. So nothing to mention, nothing to really to understand for those um, definitions. But the last thing is the most important and it's probably new to a lot of uh, our students, which is called coefficient of variation, okay? Coefficient of variation, also called CV.
Uh, yes, I mean, uh, the image quality will be affected by the internet speed from my side. So, uh, I feel so sorry that you 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 are experiencing blurry in uh, in the live streaming. But uh, from my screen, I can basically see my writing very clearly. So I'll try and and um, write it bigger so that everyone can see it clearly. Okay. All right. So the the very last thing, coefficient of variation, and uh, you have to really understand why we bother calculating the coefficient of variation. Now, let's think about um, let's think about um, the following example. Okay, so uh, well, any multiple choice or probably no. Uh, no multiple choice, sorry. Uh, but let's suppose there are multiple choice questions. Uh, okay. Uh, but if not, just don't worry about that. Um, coefficient of variation. Well, for coefficient of uh, variation, let's think about this. If I tell you there are two uh, different stocks, okay, two stocks, and the first stock has a, uh, a a standard deviation of uh, oh, well the two stock can be uh, for example uh, Tony's Kitchen TKC is for Tony's Kitchen you might uh, have seen this company in some of your tutorials because some of them are still using my materials from previous semesters okay so Tony's Kitchen and another example can be uh, uh, for example KFC all right Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, I'm or yeah. Oh, sorry, Korean fried chicken. Sorry about that. Yeah, they are Korean fried chicken. So there are two stocks. All right. So the standard deviation of those two stocks can be well for Tony's Kitchen. Uh, the standard deviation is a hundred dollars. Okay, and for Korean fried chicken, uh, the standard deviation is ten dollars. So simply from the standard deviation, can we say? that um, Tony's Kitchen is riskier than Korean fried chicken. What do you think? Which one is riskier? Or which of the stock is more volatile? Can we directly tell it from uh, standard deviation? Uh, yes. So April Lee, no. Someone say yes, someone say no. Okay, so, so what should be the answer? Well, now, if I give you some additional information, if I say the average price, okay, the average price of Tony's Kitchen is $10,000. And for uh, the K Korean fried chicken, the average price is what? Uh, for example, $50. Now, which stock do you think is more risky or riskier? Definitely KFC, right? So we can see from this simple example, the standard deviation cannot give us any idea on whether or not the data is volatile or not volatile. And it cannot help us making decisions which one is more volatile and which one is less volatile. So in order for us to really make the comparison, we had to cancel out uh, the, the, the effect of the scale or the magnitude of the data. So that's why we calculate CV. So CV, if you forget their formula, don't worry. It's simply the standard deviation divided by the average or the mean. So we can say for CV, it's usually a, a percentage number. Here, the standard deviation only takes 1% of the total average price. So it's a, a relatively a smaller a fluctuation compared to Korean fried chicken, right? So many of you have the right answer. It depends on the mean, exactly. So for Korean fried chicken, uh, this CV value is 20%. 10 over 50. So you can say by comparing the CV, we can know the standard deviation among its average or how, what, what, how large the percentage does standard deviation take in, diff, in the average so that we can compare the relative variation of those two set of data. 
So that's why we bother calculating coefficient of variation. Okay, it's basically because of two things. First of all, we canceled out the unit, right? So there won't be any unit in CV. And secondly, we canceled out any scales or what we call magnitude. Magnitude. Magnitude is how large or how um, how um, uh, how small the data is. So in CV, we canceled out both of those two um, things so that um, uh, we can directly compare them. So Chi Deng is asking the risk per unit of return. Well, the risk per unit of return. Yeah, exactly, yes. So it can be uh, the average return if we calculate CV in, in that way, okay? Okay, all right, uh, but um, not necessarily, uh, I don't know, but forget it, <laughs> for CV, all right? So for population CV, again, is sigma over mu, and uh, for, for, for sample CV, uh, it's, um, uh, it's uh, S divided by X bar. So uh, here is how we calculate coefficient of variation. So later on, we will have a very similar stuff that is pretty much like uh, the, the reason why we calculate CV, which is the coefficient of, uh, of uh, correlation, okay? So we will introduce that in a moment. So, so far, that's all I can think about regarding the discrete measures for variations. So if you can think, of, think about anything else, don't worry, just let me know, okay? So, so far we've covered, uh, let's say, we've covered the big picture of statistics. We get to know the parameters and statistics. And then in the next session, we will, uh, I mean, in the next part, we covered the discrete measures for central tendency, as well as the discrete measures for variation. So, um, if so, uh, if you're happy with uh, both of them, uh, let's have a little break now and let's look at some questions from our audiences, okay? Because I, I've noticed your questions, but I don't have time to, uh, uh, to um, do it. So someone say I can set the quality uh, manually. Well, well, if I change the quality, uh, I have to change uh, the, the, the lag legacy of um, the, um, the live streaming. I have to stop it. But I think so far the, the image quality is good. It's okay, at least. Um, okay, what next? Um, next questions. Oh, uh, I think there are questions. Will the live be recorded? Yes, it will be recorded. So don't worry if uh, you don't have time. Okay. Uh, anything else? Uh, Interquartile range. Are there any multiple choice? Oh, probably not. Uh, it's the mean the same. It's the real issue. What about portfolio? Uh, of stock A and stock B. Can we use CV to interpret diversification? Well, uh, I think we will cover that in the next session. So someone say, Xin Yun Lu asks, excuse me, how long will the session last? It's probably last one hour and a half or one, one hour something. So I know if you uh, are feeling too much things in you, you probably feel uncomfortable. So I will just finish the discrete measures for today and uh, just call it a day, okay? Uh, so yeah, that's all about discrete measures of variation. And the third thing, uh, well, oh, so many questions. Excuse, uh, how many questions will be in the again? Ask Boris, okay? Well, I don't know anything about exam. This is what I said in the ED announcement, right? So if you do have any questions regarding exams, ask Boris. So Boris will be the very right person for you uh, to ask, okay? So for me, sorry, I don't know uh, anything as 
Boris is gonna cry. Why? <laughs> Will we get a formula sheet at Canvas or at the exam? Oh, that's a good question. Ask Boris, right? <laughs> okay, now let's move on to the third part. Um, so we finished the big two parts, descriptive of central tendency for variation. And another thing is the descriptive description or descriptive measure for a relative standing. So relative standing, it means the, the location uh, of uh, that um, data, okay? So for relative standing, uh, it's pretty straightforward. We will just, um, we will just uh, uh, summarize um, a, a number of them. So the most commonly used is the median, right? Median is the data that sits in the middle. And secondly, we have uh, uh, quartile, right? The first quartile, second quartile, this stands for the 25%, 50%, and 75% of those locations. And you know the 50% quartile is, or, or I mean percentile, right? 50% percent percentile is just the median. And as I said, you also have percentile, right? Per percentiles, including the first percentage, tw second, tenth, and, 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 and so on, in a hundred percentiles. So you have detailed formulas. Uh, you have detailed formulas uh, before uh, in your exam, uh, I mean, formulas in your textbook or slides. So just go and refer to that. As I said, I'll just give you a structure of what you learned. And for some uh, important things, I'll give you some explanations, okay? So that's all about descriptive measures for relative standing. And the fourth thing uh, is the descriptive measures for the shape of uh, descriptive measures for the shape of the distribution. So this, this can be confusing for some students because uh, it's a, a shape of the distribution. So descriptive measures for the shape of the distribution. Um, in this part, we do have two new uh, descriptive measures that is a, provided for your own readings and uh, some of you asked uh, have asked in the uh, in the online questionnaire so I'd like to explain a little bit about screwness as well as ketosis screwness and ketosis so first of all in terms of uh, screwness uh, it measures uh, whether the data is uh, it's symmetric okay so whether the data is symmetric or the distribution is symmetric. Oh gosh, how do I spell it? Symmetric, whatever. Symmetric or not. So, well, here's the trick. If you forget uh, how to spell any words in your exam, well, this is something that I always tell uh, in my tutorial. So, uh, so, so if you forget how to spell, for example, symmetric, but you roughly know how, how the symmetry look like. So you can do symmetric. Uh, with a point here to show that you know there's an I here, okay? Or you put a T here, so symmetric, uh, so th yeah, right? Okay, uh, all right, so uh, symmetric or not, yes. So for screwness, you don't have to know how to calculate um, the screwness, but uh, in order for somebody wants, that wants to know, uh, it's calculated by, uh, I can't remember exactly, but it's basically the sum of any data minus x bar to the power of three, okay? So it's basically like a, th a third uh, power of um, the ver version of variance, okay? And then divided by, uh, um, the, the, the cube of uh, the standard deviation. So I remember it's calculated in this way, but if I'm wrong, <coughs> just forget it. But, but I just want to let you know that it's the third moment of uh, the data. But anyway, um, in this way, if we take a, uh, take a power of three, the positive and negative does matter, right? 
So if there are more positives than negatives, uh, you're gonna have a positive result. And if there are more negative than positive, you're gonna have a negative result. So here, we will result in a, a positive screwness. So if it is a positive screwness or right side screwed, uh, it's uh, it has a fatter tail on the right hand side, right? <coughs> or more extreme values on the right hand side. So that you can see this extreme value will make the positive terms much more than the negative term so that it will make uh, the screwness positive. Uh, so we can say if uh, screwness is positive, it's screwed to the right, right? And uh, again, uh, C.E. Pang is asking if, uh, uh, if uh, it is negative, and yes, so you can see probably here is the mean, right? And you can see there are more extreme values to the left hand side compared to the right hand side, so that uh, we will have uh, a negative screwness, and this is called screw to the left, okay? And uh, when screwness equals zero, so if it's zero screwness, uh, the distribution will be symmetric, okay? So it will be absolutely symmetric. And one more thing uh, you have to pay attention to is that when screwness is zero, uh, the mean equal median equal mode, right? So three of those amps are equal to each other. But if it is positively screwed, well, yeah, I will talk about ketosis later on, okay? Uh, but don't worry, but, but for positive screwed, here is the mode, right? So we can see mode, and what about median and mean? Is median less than mean or mean less than median? What do you mean by the height of Japanese should be positive screw. I don't know, uh, but um, do not do that, okay? This is uh, very rude, all right? Um, mode, uh, so mode will be less than oh, median or, or, or mean. I can't remember exactly, uh, but I think it should be less than median and then less than mean, right? Yeah, this is from my memory. Yeah, I, I think so, because the median should be something that in the middle, and uh, the mean it will be heavily affected by those extreme values, right? So it uh, tend to be more, uh, more screwed to the right, okay? And for negative ones, it's the opposite, mean less than median, less than mode, okay? So mode, median, mean, all right? So yeah, okay, so that's all about uh, uh, screwness. And uh, in terms of uh, ketosis, uh, it actually describes how sharp, uh, how sharp the distribution is or how flat the distribution is, okay? So you can say ketosis uh, it's it's actually describe how the peak is flat or sharp, all right? So uh, ketosis is actually calculated uh, by xi minus x bar to the power of four <coughs> divided by s to the power of four. So it's the fourth power and then minus three. Well, why minus three? Okay, you don't have to know it so far, but, but you may, ha may have noticed in 2015 uh, exams in the true and false question, there is a question talking about the ketosis calculated in the Excel is actually uh, the, the ketosis plus three or, or minus three or whatever, right? So uh, yeah, that one is true. So um, uh, because uh, this one is called excess ketosis, uh, I mean, uh, this one is called excess ketosis. Uh, the standard value is zero. So if if uh, the, this ketosis is zero, the distribution will be a perfect uh, bell shaped. It's pretty much like the normal distribution, okay? And uh, so this is equal zero. If uh, something is less than zero, I mean, the ketosis is less than zero, 
we expect a、um, a sharper.、Uh, let me see if it is sharper or or flatter. Ah,、uh, it's flatter. So we we ah、uh, we expect a lower peak, a flatter peak, and、uh, with a <coughs> fatter tails. Okay, fatter tails, flatter peaks. All right. So this is when ketosis is small. And again, if the ketosis is greater than than zero, it means, uh, it's uh the ketosis is very large. Oh, I I I don't think so. It's just because the ketosis is large, so that is flat, right? Sorry about that. This is when ketosis is greater than zero. Sorry, I I've got a headache. Uh, so uh, I may uh just um you know, <laughs> forget a lot of things. But uh, yeah, this is when ketosis is large. So it's 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 flatter, right? Because it's pretty much like the variance of the variance, right? The variance of the variance means if it is large, it will be. Much bigger than before, and if it is it is less than zero, and then we will have a sharper peak with、uh, thinner tails. Okay, something like that. All right. So um, this is uh what ketosis describes, and uh, as some students said, uh, in Excel you can calculate ketosis using descriptive summaries or use uh, uh the formula Kurt. And、uh, I don't really know if、uh, this curt return with you the excess ketosis or something without minus three. You can check on the、uh, Excel help file, and they will tell you everything. Okay. But、uh, well, again, this is not、uh, the calculation or the value of this is not a part of the test in your exam. So you don't have to know how to calculate that. All right. So just you need to know how to calculate um, the. Um, Uh, how to interpret the result? It will be more than enough. Okay, so、uh, Boris told me. Oh, I don't know whether Boris will will listen to this or not. But but actually, Boris told me that、uh, for descriptive statistics, you will be tested even though you don't have、uh, any.、Um, You don't have any,、uh, you know what what is called uh multiple choice question, right? You don't have any multiple choice questions. But Boris told me you will be given something like an Excel output of all kinds of different descriptive measures, and you are you will be asked to 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 you know to explain uh those descriptive measures. Okay, so that's what Boris told me. I don't know if it is true or not true. But、uh, that's what I know from Boris. Okay. Hopefully Boris is not here. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's not here, Boris. <laughs> he will even not listening to the recordings, Boris, because Boris is so handsome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway,、uh, so that's all about the descriptive measures of the shape of the distribution, and、uh, for the relative standings, uh, and. Uh, Lastly,、uh, oh, you want to take a screenshot of last paper? You can screw it、uh, back for four hours, up to four hours, and pause it and take a screenshot of the last paper. Okay,、uh, but I will still show you the the the, the very last paper here,、uh, so that you can see it clearly. Okay, so are you ready for the screenshot? All right. Okay, now. <clears throat> The last discrete measure, which is also the most important one, is the discrete measure of、uh, the relationships or their co correlations. Okay, so descriptive measures of、uh, linear correlations. I would call it that. Okay, of linear linear means. Line, line, okay, linear, linear, okay, linear correlations, or how two variables move together, okay. Now, in here we basically learned covariance as well as coefficient of correlation. So if you still studying finance five thousand one. 
uh, the following uh, 10 minutes will also be extremely helpful, even more helpful than in Cubas 5001, okay? This is a very important topic in Fink 5001, all right? Uh, okay, but anyway, um, we have to think about the discrete measures of uh, those linear correlations, and it, it has something to do with uh, the portfolio diversifications as well, okay? So, yeah, you can call it bonus time. CAPAM, well, actually it's not in CAPAM, it's just in portfolio diversifications, uh, as well as um, the same becomes so vague. Oh my goodness, sorry, but the internet space says it's very fast. It's 3.5 megabytes per second. It should be very clear. So check your own uh, internet. For me here, it's it's okay. I mean, yeah, it's it's okay. But anyway, we will start. This is the last one, discrete measures of linear correlation. Ah, I know why it's blurry. When I put my hands here, the focus will be on my hands instead of the background scenes. So that's why you see it blurry. Once I remove my hands, oh wow, it becomes much more clear, uh, much clearer, right? Okay, forget it. <laughs> Let's keep talking about the discrete measures of linear correlations. But before I introduce with you the formulas for the uh, covariance or coefficient, coefficient, uh, co co sorry, correlation coefficient, I would like to uh, show you what does that mean by uh, by this kind of linear correlations. Okay, so now let's suppose I've got a variable x, okay? So for variable x, I've got four observations. One, two, three, and four. Uh, one, two, three, four. So I, I love my accent very much. Um, okay, and for variable y, you also got uh, the same four uh, observations. One, two, three, four. Probably in a time order or whatever, okay? Um, all the chicken wings for KFC and uh, Tony's Kitchen. Um, so you observe four of them and say if they are correlated. So anything, all right? Now, if you want to measure whether X and Y are moving together, okay? So for example, for X, uh, the X bar is uh, here. This is X bar and Y bar is around here, for example. And uh, the first observation is here, there, there, and there. So this is X, and this is Y, here, here, and here. For example, this is X and Y, okay? So uh, you want to know uh, why, uh, whether X and Y are moving together, right? So how can we... How can we calculate whether or not X and Y, those two variables, are moving together or moving oppositely, okay? Moving together or moving oppositely to each other, all right? So now, the, most, uh, the one way that we can apply is to take a different measurement uh, pretty, uh, or a calculation method that is pretty much like when we calculate the variances. So again, we use this, we try and calculate this difference and compare it with this difference. So when, if in the first observation, this is x1, this is y1, and you can see when x has a positive variation from its mean, y has also a positive variation from its mean, right? So in this way, they are moving together, right? However, when here, x has a negative variation from its mean, y has a positive variation from its mean. So in this way, they are sort of moving um, negatively to each other, right? And similarly, here is positive, y negative, and x negative, y negative, right? So if we multiply those uh, 
difference one by one, we can sort of uh, work out uh, in total whether they tend to move together or in most of times they move oppositely by comparing if this number is positive or negative. What I said by this is that I'm ab about to calculate the xi minus x bar multiplied by yi minus y bar. So if I calculate that for each pair of the observations, I can get a lot of uh, numbers. Some of them are positive, right? So here, positive, 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 and negative, positive, negative, right? And positive, negative, negative, and negative, negative, positive. So that for each op pair of observations, I can get a number of positive results as well as negative results. And we're gonna see whether is the, the positive ones dominates those variations or the negative terms dominates the whole uh, products or the whole terms so that we add them all together from the first pair of the observations to the nth pair of the observations. And once we add them all together, we can take uh, similarly take an average of uh, those variations, just like variance, right? So we divide all of those uh, those uh, sums by n minus one as well, which stands for uh, the the degree freedom. So this is how we define the sample covariance. Okay, so sample covariance. So sample covariance is usually denoted by S X Y. Okay, and similarly, population covariance sigma uh, sigma x y equals one over big N, right? And uh, the sum of one to big N x i minus mu mu x multiplied by x uh, y i minus mu y. So this is population parameter version. Okay, so population covariance, and this is sample covariance. So you can say, if there are more positive results here than negative ones, the covariance tend to be larger than zero, right? And they tend to, in most of time, they tend to uh, moving together, right? So uh, yes, uh, some of you is asking, how do we calculate the covariance by using EXY minus EX and EY? We will introduce that later on in, in probably tomorrow, okay? Uh, and uh, well, uh, even not tomorrow, because it's, I know that question is from your Aplia, and I'm pretty sure you, you're not gonna be tested uh, that difficult uh, in calculation. Uh, I mean, it's not difficult, but it's complex in the calculation. So don't worry about ex y minus ex ey stuff. All right. But so far, you get you, you you need to understand the covariance. Okay. So s x y is uh, it can be greater than zero, equal zero, less than zero. So if x x y is greater than zero, we know uh, there exists a positive a positive linear correlation, right? And if it is equal to zero, um, there is no linear correlation. And if it is less than zero, negative linear correlation. So positive linear correlation means they're in most of time, they tend to move together, right? And in negative linear correlations, they tend to move in the opposite Y. So in portfolio theories, especially, uh, if we want to achieve portfolio diversification, we need uh, the correlation or later on, uh, sorry, covariance, I mean the covariance or later on the correlation coefficient to be negative because if two stocks are most likely to move opposite to each other, the going up can be canceled out by the going down, right? So if they add them together, the risk tend to be smaller. So that's why we have portfolio diversification conditions to be the SXY less than zero or the coefficient of correlation less than zero. So this is the first thing, all right? Covariance, okay?
So here, this part is all about covariance. Now, lastly, um, the most annoying one, uh, it's not annoying one, but um, we also have a row XY that stands for what? The uh, cor correlation coefficient, okay? This is called correlation coefficient. And the idea of calculating correlation coefficient is very much similar to calculating CV, which is coefficient of variation, because we want to cancel out the magnitude as well as the unit in the covariance. So let's say in the covariance, what is the unit of this covariance? So again, if I, we suppose X and Y, both of them have a unit of dollars, Dollar multiplied by dollar is still dollar square, right? So we don't want to see that because whenever you change the magnitude or you change the unit of the data, you will get an absolutely different value of covariance. And that is not helpful at all for us to make any decisions. So by simply from covariance, we can only know whether it's positive linear correlation or no correlation or negative correlation, but we can never know whether the linear correlation is strong or not, okay? So here's the key thing. From covariance, we can never know whether the linear correlation is strong or not. But this problem can be solved by coefficient of um, correlation. So KXY is, oh, sorry, rho XY is calculated by uh, any uh, variance divided, uh, covariance divided by the standard deviation on both uh, data. In this way, you can see dollar squared divided by dollar and dollar canceled out, all right? So it's basically canceled out everything. And uh, in this way, the rho XY we finally got a correlation coefficient to be nicely having a range from minus one to one. So all you need to know about correlation coefficient is under each scenario, what does the relationship between X, Y look like? Okay, so I'm gonna draw a file diagram showing with you uh, the relationship between X and Y or when Y and X, so Y and X, 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 okay. Now, first of all, if rho x, y equal minus one, what do you expect? Exactly. So, uh, sorry, what else question? Why is sample covariance represented with an s? Well, that, that's, that's uh, well, well, s is for sample, well, well, why? I mean, there's no why, because it's just denoted in that way, okay? Uh, yeah, don't worry. Okay, so rho xy, uh, equal, when rho xy equal minus one, um, it's, a, it's called a perfect negative linear correlation. So all the data point will be sit perfectly on a straight line with a negative, um, uh, negative um, oh, I forgot that word. Slide, no, 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 it's called slope. Uh, yeah, yeah, the slope, negative slope. Sorry, I'm too old, probably. Um, so this is one extreme um, condition. And uh, when rho xy is equal to one, and we will observe a perfect positive linear uh, 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 line, okay? Yeah, gradient. Oh my God, gradient is more professional, right? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott Egard Saint. Sorry, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce that. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so rho xy equals zero. So when rho xy equals zero, um, it means there's no linear correlation between x and y. So that you will observe this kind of stuff. So it's just random scatters no patterns that can be found at all. 
Okay, and uh, usually uh, when you uh, when we are in week uh, 10, 11, and 12, we're going to learn linear, re linear regression. And in that week, uh, we usually observe uh, a row either less than zero, of less than zero, but greater than minus one, or we can observe a row that, that is less than one, greater than, than, than zero. So here, there are some negative relationship, but it's not a perfect um, uh, linear relations. So you may observe X and Y scatters looks like uh, that. Okay. All right. So this is how a row X, Y is less than zero looks like, but still greater than minus one. And um, if we observe a row x, y that is greater than one, but still less than, uh, greater than zero, but it's still less than one, uh, you will know the answer, right? So it's, uh, it will be a positive value. Oh, sorry, positive relationship, okay? But it's not a perfect positive linear correlation, okay? Oh, good. So basically, that's all about the descriptive uh, statistics or different descriptive measures of, uh, uh, of um, um, statistics. And uh, you can see that's all about what we covered today. So do you feel tired or you can still hang on for another 15 minutes? Uh, because I'm thinking about if uh, I'm going to talk about the probabilities or not, okay? Or we can do it tomorrow and you want to digest a little bit for today. So just make a quick pull and see if you want to open the new topic of probability and it's a probability distribution or we leave it tomorrow and you're tired. Oh my God, another hour. Oh my goodness. Well, um, standard error, Wilson, uh, standard error and standard deviation uh, will be uh, covered in week four. So don't worry if you, you are still here uh, for, for uh, on Wednesday, okay? So on Wednesday, I will explain the difference between, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the standard deviation and, uh, and standard deviation and uh, what else? Tomorrow is another day, yeah, another day in, in paradise, right? So I'll grab a drink, oh, it's here, right, water. And I'll have some water, and then we'll move on a little bit about, um, <laughs> about uh, you sleep, you die. Okay, go on, unbiased estimate, th those will be covered in the, in, in the day after tomorrow, okay? Uh, yes, the time will be the same, 7.30. And if you don't have time to watch it, you can watch the, the recordings, okay? But let's get started with a little bit regarding probability, okay? And then we call it a day. So that uh, tomorrow, uh, we can directly move on to random variable as well as um, uh, the... Um, random variable as well as the probability distributions. That will be a very big topic and I will tell you the full mark version of answering questions in your exam, okay? So if you wanna get a full mark, don't forget to come back tomorrow, all right? So uh, when we talk about probabilities, again, the concepts are the most important things. So when we talk about probabilities, uh, let's start uh, with uh, some basic concepts. The first concept you need to know is uh, called random experiment. Well, I have, a, I have a condition for continuing for another half an hour or whatever, is that you have to know everything I introduce, especially about uh, the probabilities uh, before tomorrow, because Otherwise, I don't want to introduce all of those concepts once again, but those concepts within probabilities and distributions, they are very closely related, okay? So for random, so I'll start with a random experiment, all right? So random experiment 
is defined as a experiment that can generate random outcomes. So for example, if you, if you, if you toss a, a die or roll a die, okay? If you roll a die, you, do you know what is a die? Die is a cube with uh, six surfaces. Yeah, cube must have six surfaces. And uh, when you place Chinese mahjong, right? You have one, two, three, or whatever, right? So six um, surfaces, six results. If you roll a die, and you will see this random experiment can generate how many outcomes? So I'll just finish the definition, okay? And then we'll, I'll see you tomorrow. So if you roll a die, you have six outcomes. Uh, those six results are called different outcomes. We have O1, O2, outcome three, outcome four, outcome five, and outcome six. Uh, yeah, 66, I know, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, so those are called outcomes, okay? So outcomes, random experiment can generate outcomes. So this is the first important um, uh, concept, the second important concept. And the third important concept is called sample space. Sample space. Sample space means the set that put all the outcomes together. We get a sample space, okay? So sample space is the whole set of all outcomes. Of, uh, uh, that is called sample space. So this is the third K concept. And the very last K concept is called what? It's called, yeah, events. Events. So for the events, they are defined as any subset. Any subset of uh, the outcomes or any subset of the whole sample space. So here is called an event. Well, outcomes themselves are subsets of sample space. So outcomes are events, but the events are not necessarily outcomes. So for example, an event can be rolling a die and get odd numbers. So for odd numbers, they contain three outcomes, one, three, and five. So this one can be one event, but it contains three possible outcomes. Okay, so outcomes themselves are events, but events are not necessarily outcomes. It can contain all, um, more, than one, more than one outcomes, or it can contain no outcomes. All right, so the first thing, okay, the first uh, takeaway uh, of uh, probability theory is random experiment, outcomes, sample space and events. So try and understand those four concepts before tomorrow, okay? And the very key thing of in this chapter is you have to know, okay? The key to the key to the key, okay? The most important thing is you need to understand probability is actually described the feature of events or outcomes, okay? Describe the feature of events, okay? Probability describes, describes the feature, okay? The feature of a event or events. Why is that so important? That's because every time you are going to solving a probability problem, you have to do what first, okay? You have to, f to the first thing, you have to define what? Events, okay? You have to define event first, okay? So it's pretty much like let uh, A, right? B is to be uh, flipping a coin, right? Flipping a coin and getting a head, right? Getting a head. So yeah, this is the first thing you have to do in answering a probability type question, okay? So you need to know probability, describe the feature of event. So every time you ask of a probability of anything, you have to define the relative event first, okay? 
and then you can write the probability of uh, that event. For example, probability of A event, right? It's what, what, what. And for event, they have a uh, different, um, uh, they have different uh, definition, uh, I mean, relationships for two events. For example, uh, for the calculation of events, we have uh, joint events, right? So it can be interception or union. So this is called joint events. And uh, we also have two events that are mutually exclusive, which means uh, uh, they don't have anything in common. And uh, we also have uh, exhaustive events uh, or mutually exclusive and exhaustive events. So those are the events that takes the whole sample set space, like A1, A2, A3. So those are mutually exclusive and exhaustive events. So for the relationships of the events, you'd better do your own readings in your own time, okay? So I won't spend too much time on that because they are very, very straightforward. Just remember those key words, okay? Relative, well, what is that? Relation, yeah, relationships of events. So you need to know uh, what is A union, uh, A interception B, and what is A uh, union B, and what is A complement, right? A complement, or A complement, or whatever. Complement is no A, right? And uh, you should also know uh, yeah, I think that's all. Those are the calculations. It's pretty much like the set we learned before, right? Okay, so that's all about the events on, of, on the probabilities. And in terms of probabilities, I didn't say any of you asking about the definitions of uh, joint probability, marginal probabilities, and conditional probabilities. So what about I leave it to, uh, for your homework, and I believe uh, you won't find it difficult. They are just very simple uh, definitions. Uh, once you do one or two practice, you can easily get to them. And uh, no, no students ask this kind of question uh, in, in the feedback. So I suppose all of you are happy with that, okay? So you need to know um, only two things. The first thing is the three types of, uh, three types of uh, probabilities. So they include, um, yes, I'll just brief uh, talking about it. So they include joint probabilities, and uh, marginal probabilities and uh, conditional probabilities. Okay, so those are the three types of uh, probabilities. That's the first thing that you should be able to know uh, about the probabilities. And uh, these type of questions usually give you uh, different events and their corresponding probabilities. For example, we have A1, A2, B1, B2, okay? And we know the probability is 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, and 0 0.1, okay? So within this table, all data in this area are called joint probabilities, okay? Joint probabilities. And they are denoted, for example, this 0 0.3 is denoted as the probability of A1 interception B1, okay? Or A and B, so that it's 0 0.3. So this is when A1 and B1, both of them happening together, okay? So this is, so all those four things are joint probabilities, okay? And now, another thing we've got is marginal probabilities. Well, for marginal probabilities, it's nothing new, but it's just a new name of the probability of one single event, regardless of the other events. So for example, if I want to calculate the probability of A1, how do we do that? Regardless, regardless of B1 and B2, it's simply calculated by the probability of A1 interception B1 plus pro the probability of A1 interception B2, right? So that it's simply 0 0.3 plus 0 0.4, which is 0 0.7.
So that you can say in this kind of distribution table, if you write, if you, if you calculate the sum on this margin, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, this is 0 0.5, this is 0 0.5, right? So all of those are actually what? Called marginal probability, okay? I should use another color of it so that you can easily tell the difference. So, okay, so this is the marginal probabilities, okay? These are called marginal probabilities. And uh, you can say they are on the margin, right? <laughs> they are located on the margin. So that's why they are called marginal probabilities. And they are simply the probability of a particular event, regardless of any other events, okay? Marginal probabilities. And lastly, uh, and most importantly, uh, we got uh, conditional probabilities. So conditional probabilities. Well, for conditional probabilities, many of the students tend to mix up uh, the conditional probabilities and joint probability. I'd like to briefly explain the difference between joint probability and conditional probability using a very simple example so that you will never forget, okay? So for joint probability or the end probability, uh, if we do have a event A and event B, when we ask what is the probability of A and B happening together, we are asked about the joint probability. So it stands for this area divided by the whole sample space, okay? So it's actually the, the area of A intersection B divided by the whole sample space. So this is the probability of um, the joint probability, okay? However, when we talk about conditional probability, so for example, we are asked, what's the probability of uh, A given B, okay? What's the probability of A given B? Then this means for something that is already given, it's, it means we know B has already happened, okay? So if B has already happened, what's the probability of A and B happening together, right? So if B has already happened, this, that means the only part that we should take into consideration is the B part because we know B has already happened. So all the rest can never happen, right? So they can never happen for the whole other sample space, right? So given that condition, what's the probability of A and B happen together? So you can say for conditional probability is actually the A and B interception divided by what? B instead of the whole sample space, right? So divided by B. So that makes the definition formula of conditional probability, which is calculated by the probability of A interception B, which is this area, divided by the probability of B, which is something that we know that has already happened, okay? So um, for this question, let's take a simple example. What's the probability of A1 given B1? Okay, so A1 given B1, let's say the probability of A1 interception B1 divided by the probability of B1, right? So this is the definition formula of conditional probability. So A1 B1 interception 0 0.3 and the probability of B1 is 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So that we got 660, oh, this is 66, this is 66, 66, right? So we got um, 66, 66, 66%. Okay. The very, very, very last thing, oh, sorry, the very, very last thing of uh, today is the independency of two events or variables, okay? So, two independent events. Okay, the last thing, okay? La, 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 last thing. Uh, last thing. Independent events. Okay, for independent events, we're gonna have, oh really? 
Oh, six. Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm probably too hungry. Yeah, it's 0 0.6. <laughs> I am so stupid. <laughs> yes, it's 0 0.6. Okay, well, the very last thing that we're going to talk about is how to do we decide if two events are independent. So before that, many of you uh, are confusing about mutually exclusive events and independent events. So I'd like to uh, briefly let you know the differences between mutually exclusive and uh, independent events, okay? So mutually exclusive events. Well, for mutually exclusive events, it means for example, if we have events A and B that are claimed to be mutually exclusive, then it means they can never happen together, right? They can never ever happen together. Never happen together with each other. Never happen together. So I'd like to give you a very um, interesting, uh, not interesting, but a very good example so that once you know this example, you will never confuse the difference between independent events and uh, mutually exclusive events, right? So what example can they be? So flip one coin, okay? Flip one coin. What are the possible results? So you can get head and tail, right? So let's suppose there's no third result, like uh, sitting uh, on the edge, right? Nothing like that, only head and tails, okay? So we say that head and tails are mutually exclusive, right? Because if head happens, tail can never happen. And if tail happens, head can never happen, right? So this is called mutually exclusive events, H and T. Now, in terms of independent events, in terms of independent events, this means, again, if we have events in A and B, there happen, any of them happen, will never affect each other, okay? So this basically means A and B are correlated. The result of A will never have, will never affect the result of B. Okay, so they never affect each other. Okay, they never affect each other. All right. So for independent events, a very good example is that if you flip two coins. So you can say for independent events, they usually get, have two, um, two or more uh, random experiment. But for, for mutually exclusive, we usually talk about one random experiment, okay? Hopefully you still remember what is random experiment, right? Random experiment is a experiment that the re whose result is random, right? Okay, but anyway. So flip two coins, they are actually two random, separate random experiments, right? So the first coin, okay? The first coin can have a head, I call it H1, and the tail, tail one. So again, the H, H1 and T1 are still mutually exclusive, right? And when we talk about second coin, we can have a head two and tail two. And those two events are still mutually exclusive, right? However, when we are thinking about H1 and H2, they are what? Independent, right? Or H1, T2 or T1, H2, or T1, T2. So, uh, so every time you take one result here and one result in the other experiment, we can determine if they are independent or not. So you can say the H1 happen will never affect whether H2 or T2 happen, right? So H1 and H2 or H1 and T2 are independent events. 
or T1, H2, T1, T2 are independent events because any of them happening will never affect the, the result of the second coin, right? So independent events usually takes place in different uh, random experiments, okay? Now, someone say H, H1 and T1 independent, no, they are mutually exclusive because when H1 happen, T1 can never happen, right? So H1 and T1 are mutually exclusive events because they are in, in, in one random experiments, okay? So uh, those are the differences between mutually exclusive events as well as independent events. And uh, lastly, uh, there are three equations helping you determining whether two events are independent or not. So uh, the first thing is the probability, okay, how to determine, so independent, C, determination. Well, this is a name I, I call it, uh, determination. So two events are said to be independent to each other if one of the following three equations are met, okay? So the first equation is that pay A given B equal the probability of A or the probability of B given A equal to the probability of B. So you can say because A and B's happening will never affect each other, so the probability of B's happen will never affect A's probability, right? So that's why the probability of A given B, it's just the, the marginal probability of A. And similarly, this also uh, works, right? And lastly, and you also learned probably, a and B interceptions probability uh, will equal to the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. So if any of them, if any one of uh, the three equations are satisfied, what is that? Satisfied, then we can say A and B are independent events, okay? So if any one of the three uh, uh, equations are satisfied, A and B are said to be independent events. So lastly, let's go back and see our examples uh, in the previous uh, sections. And uh, yeah, again, for A1, A2, this example, let's determine if A1 and B1 are independent or not, okay? So A1 and B1, if they are independent, then we will say A1 given B1, as we just calculated, is 0 0.6, right? And the probability of A1 itself is 0 0.7. So they are not equal to each other. So we can say that A1 and B1 are independent or not independent? Yes, they are not independent to each other. Or independent on each other or whatever. Each other, other. okay, not independent, whatever. okay? All right. So that's basically all about today. How do you feel, guys? Uh, have you found it uh, helpful or extremely helpful? What do you think? So uh, today we started uh, from the big picture of, um, of um, our uh, statistics. And um, we have different types of uh, uh, descriptive measures and uh, we find five different types of discrete measures. And, uh, and uh, yes, and we also touch a little bit about the definitions of uh, probabilities. And yes, and uh, that's all uh, for today. And uh, I'll hope to see you tomorrow at the same time, okay? All right, so see you guys tomorrow. No Ari, thank you very much. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll stop the, the, the live streaming now. What is thanks bra? What is a bra? Don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> Boris JR, who is Boris JR? You are the Boris Jr. Okay, yeah, true, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Oh, by the way, uh,
a surprise for all of you. Today we have three team members helping here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, don't hide yourself, okay? All right. <laughs> Thank you very much for their contributions. They are controlling actually the the, uh, the quality of the whole live streaming. And uh, I will not uh, show myself uh, now because uh, I just uh, uh, got up and I uh, feel very sleepy. So I'll go back and sleep. Uh, and I hope to see you guys tomorrow. Bye bye. <laughs> if you got any questions. I love Gary. I love Gary. <laughs> Okay, well, um, tomorrow, same time, okay? And uh, what I want to say, uh, nothing else to say. Bye-bye. <laughs>